radio station. No such luck, I said. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is a freebie. Uh, so we were allowed through. This is the first time for you. It was a choice for you, is it not? No, second. Just the second time around. Yeah, I came, I came here once before with Roxy. Um, about two years. Uh, no, one and a half years ago. Uh -huh. And played an extremely unsuccessful 35 minutes at the Cobo Hall. Supporting Humble Pie. Oh, it was considerably more popular than last time. Yeah, it's a different story now. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'm going to come back and talk. Yeah. Can you know, you know, in just a second? We're going to play a couple of bills here. Oh. All right, this is the old Christmas song I'm on late. And uh, I'm very happy to meet this man. I've heard so many good things about him. And uh, I was delighted when uh, Simon called me on Friday and said you were coming in on I was very happy to hear that. But uh, talking about lots of music, uh, can I have uh, your sentence in on what uh, what we're doing right now? We're very popular here, very big here. Yeah, in fact, um, it's just happened here for them, hasn't it? And uh, I was back in about the last two or three months. I would say so. Now, uh -huh. now for some folks, like we have a lot of people sitting right here right now with us who have been turned out of your music for a long time. Yeah. I have been uh, here. Here's a try this out here. Uh, I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I got to run about perhaps two or three months ago. Uh -huh. You know, tuned into what you were doing yeah. myself. So I would say that the public at large would be about three or four months ago, right? Um, yes, I, I'm, uh, I still work with some of the members of Roxy quite extensively. Like I'm, in a month's time, I'm recording with Phil and Paul from Roxy. Uh -huh. And I'm doing, I use them throughout the whole album, you know. It won't be just like guest musicians, they'll be there all the time. It's going to be Eno, Phil and Paul, is that how it will be built? No, no. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to get the time going, right? No, well, what happens is that they won't be the only people in, on the album. They'll, they'll also be Fripp, who should be there quite a lot, I think. Um, Brian Tarrington, who's the bass player of the Winkies, a group that you wouldn't know in Canada or America, or England. <laughs> They're not very well known at all. Um, and then various other friends. Robert Wyatt will be on it as well. In the slot machine. Yeah. When is this going to come about? Uh, well, I'll start when I get back from the States, which is on August the 5th. I'll start rehearsing for it then. And I'll start recording the middle of August or something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. When did you uh, first, uh, when did you leave Rocky Music? I mean, uh, exactly a year today. Really? Funnily enough, yeah, it, was July, it was July the 21st, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Should I ask you, it would be imposing upon you to ask you why? Um, well, there are a number of reasons. <laughs> Which one do you want? The scandalous ones? The oh, definitely the professional yeah, ones? Money. The musical ones? Scandalous, disgusting ones, for sure. The reason yeah. one, the scandalous reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that's something I'm the kind of jealousy that seemed to be driving in the group at the time. Between certain members. Number two, the professional reason. Uh, I was getting quite bored with touring practically all my life. I mean, we, we spent, um, I think, eight and a half months of the last year that I was in Roxy on tour, which I don't enjoy doing that much. I mean, a frail lad like myself, it's not so good for my complaint. I mean, I though, perhaps, uh, you might find it just a little bit different now, though, because of the acceptance of the group, you know? Well, then we were, we were touring, apart from the American tour, where we weren't well known, it was, um, I think two tours of Europe and three of England, or something like that, and we were well known there then. I mean, it wasn't a problem of acceptance at all. In fact, quite the opposite, however badly we played, we would be quite well received, which also I didn't enjoy that much. I mean, there wasn't a, any kind of panic about playing anymore, mm -hmm. or much of a challenge, really. <coughs> so, um, the musical reason, reason three, um, was that the, the nature of the rocks experiment had kind of specialized in one direction, specialized very well, I think. I mean, I think the third album is very, very good, and I don't think it needed me or anything like that. I think it is independently quite good. Do you have one too that you read? Uh, one one is that the album? Yes. Mother of Pearl, yeah. Uh, I think that's fine. I'm going to sit right down there alongside you with that. That's beautiful. I love that too. Yeah. That's beautiful. But the thing is, the third album does seem to me to be fairly different from the first two, and it's the, it's the difference, which is the area that I happen to be interested in. I mean, the third album is much more polished, really, than the first two. It's much more of a 
homogenous concept. And I'm really rather interested in the things that don't hang together in that way. Well, let's find out what he knows or he knows to right here. You know, uh, maybe some fire, but what he knows, you ever have occasion to write a song, put it out on uh, an album form or single form or whatever, and a few months later hear it, I think, gosh, I wish I hadn't done this tour or that tour or that. Oh, yeah, I always think that. There's, there's hardly any things I've ever done that I think are uh, um, perfect in that sense. The only, the only thing on that album that I haven't seen a way to improve on yet is Driving Me Backwards, which is actually the track that nobody likes very much. From here come the world chest. Yeah, it's on the other side of that. And it's, um, the reason I like it still is because um, I still hear things that I, I wasn't aware of at the time of getting the album. And there are kind of interactions between the instruments that were purely accidental and arose from really not being aware quite of what I was doing. Uh, I have to confess to you, you know, I have to, uh, I have to, with the exception of maybe on fire with you, I have to hear you put tunes a few times before I, I really... You know, capture those elusive endings. Yeah, <laughs> really. I, uh, what was your comment about this last tune again? Um, well, it's quite suicidal and hardly the thing to play at the party, I can't imagine. It's not very good to dance to. Okay. They tell me it's good to cut your wrists to the fair. Well, if you're, like, yeah. if you're using electric music, it's all right, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. It's all uh, right. Uh, like, it comes around yet. You did how long ago? Uh, I finished it in November, early November. Uh, so you would think it's perhaps musical now. I would more or less assume you're way beyond that. Yes, I'm back. Two and a half years further on yeah. from that. Uh, yeah. How about this, uh, this single that Sam gave me? Yeah, that was recorded in February, I think. Um, Which is closer, perhaps, to where well, your thoughts are musically. Closer and that. further away. Actually, it was a bit... I like it, but it was very much out on the limb for me. It wasn't... It's not like anything that I'm doing at the moment, actually. My exciting new project called Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy will be... Detailed after this single. <laughs> Just because I deserve it here. Yeah. Alright, let's give it a try. Send it on. Some deadly things. You know. Uh, they should be popular European definition of yodeling. I noticed that. <laughs> I noticed that. But when you were when you were thinking of uh, perhaps putting a tune down on a piece of paper or, or writing a tune or music. Is there any specific time of the day that you uh, like to, uh, you know, or is it just kind of like maybe no, three or five hours in your work from about this time of night onwards, actually, from about 11 onwards. That's I like always work overnight. Yeah. And generally, I like book studios for overnight sessions as well. You're one of the very rare performers that I've talked to in quite some time. Who is not at the moment interested in, in doing any touring whatsoever? No, you're quite right. <laughs> I'm quite rare in this capacity. Yes, so you are. Um, well, the reason is, as I explained well, the um, Seven Deadly Sins was playing, was that um, <clears throat> the length of time necessary to prepare for a tour is about a month. Then the tour lasts, say, six weeks. And then to recover takes about six or eight weeks, something like that. So I was talking about three and a half or four months, you see, which is quite a lot of time for me. And it's time that's basically unprogressive time. It's not unproductive time, but it's unprogressive. I mean, yeah. one doesn't expect to move very far in that time. Uh, I know, but the thing that I know is you have to pay the rent. Oh yeah, but you don't pay it by sewering, you know. I mean, you, know, you always lose money on tours, particularly American tours. Unless, of course, you become, I guess, relatively. Yes, yes, unless you become very, very big, yeah. So, you know, you are a group for her, like, let's say, uh, Martha Luther. When Mark comes over here, you think perhaps they lose money? For their last American tour, they took home 2,000 pounds because of the tax laws. That's, that's $5,000, you know, something like that. How, uh, how are the folks over in the uh, neighborhood? How are they treating your music? What's, uh, what's going on there? Oh, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, I'm a fully registered cult figure <laughs> in England, yes. How about the, uh, the media, the press, the, the radio? I, I always get a lot of press because um, 
I talk incessantly during interviews, so um, it makes it quite an easy job for a journalist who just comes along and says, what's your favourite colour? And I then expand for two and a half hours <laughs> on this and other subjects. So I, I get a lot of press now. How about, how about the radio? Are they playing on playing the tunes? Or? Yes, they do, but uh, English radio is very, very much different from <coughs> American radio or Canadian radio, I should imagine, as well. In the, first of all, there are far fewer stations. All but two of them are government controlled. There's, there's just two commercial stations that just come out, and they're both very, very middle of the road. I mean, there's only, really, there's about two progressive rock shows on English radio. And they occur late at night. Um, so the kind of forum for playing that kind of thing isn't. I mean, they're, they're the equivalent of your top 40 stations, all the radio stations in England. Um, and there's nothing. There's nothing like this station, for example. And there's nothing like um, where I was last night. Well, you were over at uh, WABX, and that's true. They're one of the pioneers in sure. this type of radio, for sure. Yes, well, in England, one doesn't have an option. I mean, really, unless you have hit singles or a very, very big album following, um, you don't really stand a chance of getting on the radio. In fact, I, I do get a fair amount of radio attention, but it's nearly always on those late night shows. That's, that's the one thing you've done. That would be something hard to do, you know, because uh, I'm sure that uh, the competition is really stiff. It is, yeah. England's full of very exciting people at the moment. What, uh, who, who's really going, you know, going down the big way up in the right now? Um, well, that isn't necessarily the people who I think are exciting. <laughs> yeah, you just tell me what, what's on your line, it's okay. Because that's what, that's what well, it seems to be interesting, but maybe, I don't know if you've heard of Sparks at all. Oh, for sure. Yeah, of course, I well, they were in a new band, for They have a team now, and perhaps you're familiar with it too, but I just started playing with short time ago. Uh, it's the same the latest single this time to get out to the best place. Yes, that was just a big hit in England as well. Uh, but Quickings and Apologies of all, it has always been my favorite line. Uh -huh. and, uh, I don't know if that was, I think their second album perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, their first, their first albums didn't do anything in England at all. It's just the third one. And also they've signed to Island Records, who are a very good record company in England, and are somewhat adventurous in their choice of artists and are prepared to promote artists who are doing something interesting. And what facilities do they have over there for, for people like that space box to uh, appear for the public? Are they, is it more or less a... They're much smaller than in America. Yeah. I mean, there's... You talk quite casually of a 5,000 seat of hall. Well, they, there isn't even one in England, I don't think. There's, there's a couple of places that aren't actually... What do you mean? Albert Hall? Albert Hall? The Albert Hall is... 7,000 seats and dreadful acoustics, so, and it doesn't allow rock music anymore anyway, so it's academic. Um, I mean, everybody avoids playing there anyway because the acoustics are so bad. The only other places are sports arenas, really, um, with equally bad acoustics. There really isn't any big concert hall of any quality in England. What about uh, the promoters per se? Do they have some good promoters over there? Yes, yeah, they are. Yeah. I mean, the, the live concert scene actually has gone downhill a bit in the last six or eight months in England, but I think it will pick up again. Before that, it was very exciting. There were a lot of good people on the road. As you know, uh, now it's getting more biased. It's getting so complicated when you take, you were talking a few months ago about. Uh, getting that together is so complicated. A promoter has to have his so-called shit to get it pretty good as well to uh, put a show up on. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, most bands now are carrying, most bands in England anyway, carrying fairly big light shows, which require a lot of ceiling space. You can't perform on small stages. Um, and they require um, a particular supply of current on the electricity supply. So that rules out a lot of calls anyway. For most people, and there's nothing worse than to turn up at a gig with all your hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of equipment and find that the promoter's got a 10 foot square stage and I can't even accommodate the drum maker. I assume that you've experienced.
strange this I was never in that dream. I'm not still in Italy, which has the the worst press of the world. Yeah. I should probably get shot for saying that. Yeah. Their affiliations are quite dubious. <laughs> yeah, the movie might have longer there was more comedy. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I have to pay a couple of bills again. And now I'm going to come back and talk to you. Do you want some more? Sure. You know, you've been sitting here with me for a while, so I'm anxious. I hope that you got. I've come to expect almost anything from you. And uh, you and Simon have uh, brought me another single that's rather interesting. What about this? Um, this is an orchestra called the Portsmouth Symphony that was started in uh, late 1969. And it was distinguished from other orchestras in that anybody could join. And that meant literally anybody, whether they could play instruments or not. And we are now 82 members on that disc. When that was recorded, we had 58 members, I think. Recently, we did a concert at London. It's fabulous where we hall at home of classical <laughs> music and transvestism. And, uh, we had an orchestra of 82 and a choir of 350, an audience of 2,500, of whom only 70 demanded their money back. <laughs> so altogether, a very successful performance. Um, what did you play on this particular tour? Clarinet. I always play clarinet. Well, we'll, we'll listen for it. Let's listen hard. All right. <laughs> 